We are a little tired by now, but uh, as you can tell from the program, we have a very exciting lineup of speakers and a lot of work uh, to do over the next uh, few hours. Um, that being said, actually, we, we start with the program change. Um, David Bollier, as it was mentioned yesterday, uh, had to change his travel plans and um, leave earlier. Now, we are extremely uh, fortunate that uh, Jean-Claude Gudon uh, agreed uh, to deliver a high order bit this morning uh, to uh, start this uh, day with uh, some reflections. And I really appreciate, Jean-Claude, that uh, you're uh, kindly offered to do so. So uh, with that, uh, I'm looking forward uh, to learning more about your uh, visions and ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Urs. Uh, yes, it's my great pleasure to have the opportunity of speaking to you once again. Uh, I'm not David Bollier, but, uh, and I'm not going to say obviously what he would have said, but I'm going to try and deal with the basic issue he was mentioning in the title and synopsis of his talk, namely the issue of commons and how it, uh, it is an issue for the academic world. In the synopsis, it is described as in terms of being a, a quest for a recovery. I would like to shift slightly the ground in showing that actually the nature of the commons in the academic world has changed across time. And I'm going to make as a basic thesis a, a, a sort of, of claim which I hope to leave you as an idea for some thought. And that is that the kind of commons we are going to either retrieve or create, personally I think we have to create it, uh, is also going to affect the relationship between two terms that are quite often confused, and those two terms are quality and excellence. So let me try and develop this uh, as well as I can uh, in order to, to leave you with that particular hypothesis in mind. Now, the, the, it has been the, the fact, and the fact that I have used myself, that uh, we have relied on images such as the Republic of Letters, the Republic of Science, uh, the market of ideas, and similar metaphors to try describing what had been going on in the way science has been carried out and knowledge has been pursued since roughly the 17th century. Now we have to realize that the Republic of Letters uh, in the 17th century was a republic of a very peculiar kind. It was a republic of gentlemen. It was a republic of self-selected elites that uh, for a number of reasons had decided to play their game of status seeking and power seeking in their respective societies in Western Europe uh, in new ways by creating actually new forms of access to knowledge. The famed debate between Boyle, uh, the man with the air pump, and Hobbes and Spinoza on the other side was really as shaping as shown in a very famous book, uh, the, uh, the uh, mark of uh, the instauration of a new form of truth uh, establishment, that truth establishment being based not, not anymore on faith or deduction, but based on the coordination of witnessing, experimenting, and of course, logical reasoning. And this, this was the republic of letters that began being built at the time. I'm not going to go through a whole history of the political forms of the republic of science or letters up to the 20th century, but one could show that this sort of self-selected community of people that uh, have been seeking knowledge and truth since the 17th century uh, has in effect reproduced itself while broadening its boundaries and developing uh, perhaps a more uh, accepting form of promotion into this what remained uh, an elite group. Now, in, in this sort of evolution, universities went out and then back into it. First of all, out because essentially when the book, the printed book came in, universities simply did not know what to do with the printed book. 
and ended up being mainly censors of books and uh, trying to control the book for the authorities. In passing, this is a telling lesson for our own times in which our own universities, I would claim, don't really know what to do with the new technologies. And uh, it's only in the 19th century that the printed book became really an integral part of the work in the university when a new form, a new form of, um, uh, I would say, of teaching and research associated together, and that in itself was new, uh, was invented. And it is the seminar form. And the seminar, as you know, is bringing printed materials into a classroom and people criticize and discuss them and build new arguments on the basis of a kind of corpus that is built for the uh, purpose of the seminar itself. Now, this, this sort of uh, creation of the new uh, truth and, uh, and uh, reality-seeking communities has been the way we with which we've been living for the last century and a half or a bit more than that. And we are, we are really in, in this kind of context, except that after the Second World War, something new again appeared. Uh, in this world of the universities, there always was competition. But it was a sort of gentlemanly competition which was tamed and, I would say, controlled by numerous kinds of tacit gentlemen's agreements. It was not a furiously driven sort of competition uh, which was organized, in fact, by forces outside the university. It was a kind of self-managed competition which allowed people to create informal pecking orders. So when you sent an article to a journal, up to the Second World War, it would be received by people from the editorial board and a mixture of content, quality, and who is this person would play into the selection or not of the person into the, uh, uh, of the article into the said journal. So you had, a, as I would say, a kind of gentlemanly form of competition. We've moved into an entirely different world after the Second World War, particularly when New, new techniques of bibliographic retrieval began to take place, and I'm referring here specifically to the Science Citation Index, and particularly when these kinds of tools went beyond what they had been designed for, which was to promote and facilitate interdisciplinary research, uh, and moved into uh, evaluation tools, quantitative evaluation tools. At that point, what we found is that administrations in the universities and grant, uh, grant uh, allocation agencies such as, let's say, the NSF in the United States uh, began to pay great attention to those indicators, as they were called, uh, quantitative indicators, which allowed to measure and, and evaluate, so it was claimed, uh, the quality of the scientists. But actually, it was not evaluating the quality of the scientists. It was creating a kind of competition to which the scientists, driven by the techniques of promotion in their own universities, quickly subscribed to. And that led to a, a really a, a wild race, which is really our regimen right now, our way of behaving in the universities nowadays. Now, just to understand what I'm talking about, because what I'm saying may remain a bit obscure, imagine that you want to create in a country, or at the level of the planet, a state of physical well-being for people. And imagine then that to do that, you develop a techniques of physical education all over the place. Actually, this is what we do in our schools. But imagine then that someone from the outside says, well, what we've got to do is really make all these people be evaluated by having them sprint a 100-meter dash. And imagine that then at the end, everybody is trying to become the person that is going to be selected uh, to be part of the world contest in the 100 meter dash, in other words, the Olympic Games. With the result that in some countries, which goes really deep into this kind of philosophy, what they decide to do is no longer to maintain 
the quality, the physical well-being and the quality of their whole population, but they want to really raise a, a, a stable of world-class uh, sprinters. And you end up having at that point a complete confusion between the quality element, which would have been the, the sort of level at which the whole population could be raised in terms of well-being, to uh, a, a, red, a, a system in which you just try and select a few stars and then you project yourself into the world through those stars. The present soccer or football, depending where you live in the world, uh, competition is a very good example of that. Zillions of kids play football, uh, only a few dozens are in that thing. No one pays attention to the good that the football games do to the kids, but we're all being driven by uh, this kind of competition. Now, what's, what has been going on is that with quantitative metrics, such as the impact factor, we've created a, a world of intense competition to get into a very, very tight system of publications, which itself has been monopolized by uh, publishers, commercial publishers, and hence the whole serial pricing crisis and similar kinds of problems. And we are completely forgetting about the quality about, uh, uh, that should rule the, the whole uh, quest for, for, um, the, um, uh, for the pursuit of knowledge and research. Now, that means that we are really building a system in which we may have a few star scientists, but we are lacking or we don't do well the uh, nurturing of large quantities of researchers at all levels. And we are, we are in effect forgetting what has been sometimes called by sociologists the Ortega hypothesis, which says actually, if you really want to reach very high summits in scientific knowledge, you also need a very broad, healthy base of competent scientists and researchers in general. Now, how is that related to the notion of commons? Well, the whole point of the commons is really to bring back to a much broader, broader population uh, the possibility of entering a form of activity which could go back to some level of what I would call gentlemanly competition, but not totally insane and completely mad competition, and thereby allowing the creation and the construction of this broad base of scientists and researchers at all levels. Why do I say this? Well, simply because to do good research, among other things, you need a good access to the literature. And if you tie the access to the literature to the wealth of the institutions or the countries, what essentially you are doing is cutting off from that kind of basic, healthy, general activity a large majority of the people that would be able to carry out this kind of activity. In, for example, in very clear terms, the way our scientific and scholarly literature right now is organized, is measured, and is circumscribed by barriers, financial barriers, toll gating of very high subscription prices, means in effect that three quarters of people in the world, because they're not in rich countries, or even in rich countries in many uh, mediocre uh, finance uh, institutions, uh, these people simply do not have, a, have access to the, uh, this literature. Hence the importance of creating open access to this liter literature and the importance of creating true commons within the academy. Now this, this means that uh, what we are doing, if we go, go in that direction, is that we have to recover the means to develop the good metrics that will really enhance the creation of such a population of healthy, good, competent researchers with a few stars. We, don't, we are not against the Olympic Games, but we want to locate them, them at, the, at their right place, and we don't want to be mesmerized by them either. And we, we can develop then these uh, techniques of nurturing, growing uh, populations of researchers and scientists. Uh, that means developing independent metrics. Now, just to give you an example of this, 
uh, the, the Latin Americans have been working very, very hard in trying to promote their own science. Why did they have to promote their own science? Well, precisely because of this very constrained and competitive, but skewedly, competitive in a skewed way, uh, uh, nature of the scientific literature of the world. So they found that they had to promote their own literature by also creating their own metrics, demonstrating that actually if you started looking at that literature from its perspective and looking at how it was being cited around, it was being cited a lot more than the Science Citation Index or Scopus were revealing uh, through their own uh, techniques of uh, monitoring scientific publishing. In effect, what they were saying is that what we consider to be world excellence would be like world biased excellence. And they, in order to promote their own science, they had in effect to demonstrate that they represented an alternative level of quality that was absolutely as acceptable and receivable as the level of quality that comes out of a lot of Western, uh, Western dominated science. So what the, the level of, uh, what the, uh, the existence, the presence of the commons can do is offer the possibility of revising the, you might say the rules of the game of competition in the world of research so as to create not a world where excellence is being sought in a kind of fetishistic way in a completely mesmerized fashion, almost in kind of hypnotized fashion, but look at how to create a high level of quality. Let me give you in very quickly another example uh, which uh, was part of the American debate recently about the health system. You have there a magnificent example of where quality and excellence collide. I think the United States probably have the largest number of centers of excellence in medicine. Yet the country, when you look at its life expectancy, ranks something like 35th in the world. Now, here is, here is a very good contrast between the ability to do extraordinarily rare and, and difficult things in one spot, but you need a lot of money to do it, and the general population being left with a very mediocre form of support for its health. Now, this kind of, of contrast is exactly what is at work right now in world science. It's exactly the kind of inequality that we observe through the tools that have been developed for evaluation, like uh, the Science Citation Index and, and Scopus. We will not be able to really review that. We will not be able to reorganize that by staying within a completely, I would say, semi-opaque or totally opaque system of publication. You don't get good statistics of usage, for example, from publishers. But if you open up the commons through repositories, open access journals, and all the techniques and, 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 and ways that have been developed and are being invented by all those that are interested in, interested in those issues. In other words, if you systematically push for the creation of an academic common, uh, I think you are going to be able to restore the importance of quality and put excellence in its right place. I'm not against excellence in passing. Don't not mistake me, but put it in its right place. Don't be mesmerized by it. It's, it's, you know, what is the importance of having 10 kilometers of superhighway if the rest of your roads is no good, which was the, the very situation of French roads after the, the Second World War. Let me finish with one remark from Christopher Kelty in his excellent book about, called Two Bits, in which he talks about the cultural uh, Im import of uh, free software. He says, and I, I felt guilty of that when I read him, he says we often refer back to Robert Merton's uh, ethos of science with all the values and all that as if they were the ontological or essential or historically grounded form of behavior in science. And Kelty, I think very shrewdly, in, in, says to us, we've been saying that as if it were ontologically the nature of science, but really what we're saying is that this is the goal where we want to go. Perhaps it's not recovering the commons that we want to do. Perhaps what we want to do is really build that republic of science by using the values that Merton identified a long time ago, knowing that they're not there, especially if you look at the activity of research in science, but even beyond science, uh, at the global level, at the level of the whole world, and not just through the lens that the Science Citation Index 
our scopus gave us. So in conclusion, I think the commons is a way to make science healthy, and by making it healthy, it will allow us to develop a clear distinction between quality and excellence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Uh, are there any questions? We have time for one or two. Yes, please. Thank you very much for this uh, inspiring presentation. Uh, I had one question or comment, uh, and that relates to what you said on a broad basis <coughs> of scientists, to, and I fully agree with what you're saying, but um, what we are witnessing in, in uh, higher education policy today is um, you know, this bias towards excellence, and in, in, at the time of globalization and when there is more researchers and scientists than ever, just because you know you have this expansion of higher education everywhere. Don't you think that there is a kind of a reshaping of this idea, and the broad base um, is no longer seen at a domestic or national level, but more at the global level? And to what extent does it challenge what you've said, or does it not? Yeah, well, two points. One is that indeed the word excellence is being bandied about all over the place. And that my, my thesis is that please let's keep a, a clear distinction between the two and let's pursue the two in their right order. Now, with regard to the issue of, of globalization, this is exactly the point, actually. If you look at how the present system of science was designed with the invention of core science, how was core science identified? Well, Garfield went around, uh, around checking with a few top scientists in the United States and Western Europe, and perhaps, perhaps a little bit beyond that, and began to say, well, what are the good journals for you? And, and, and then these people somehow were citing each other. Not a big surprise. I mean, it, it began like a co-optation system of, uh, which turned into a kind of scientific club, which managed to erect itself as if it were the model, the pinnacle, the, uh, the, the, the summit, the, 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 the sine qua non of science in the world. Now, meanwhile, all sorts of areas of science were going on and were being sometimes completely neglected, rejected, uh, or forgotten. The lost science, to use the term that was used in Scientific American about 15 years ago. And what we are seeing right now is a very interesting phenomenon with the emergence of uh, powerful countries which are in the developing range, the so-called, for example, BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, India and China, we see two trends developing. On the one hand, we see in some uh, countries, I think China is uh, to some extent in that camp, uh, is their, their strategy would be how can we get onto the bandwagon or the train uh, of the Western world. On the other hand, you have countries like, uh, like uh, South Africa, Brazil, and to some extent India, that say maybe it's time that we present our own activities as an alternative, not science, but an alternative site of quality in order to force a re-evaluation of global science, taking into account what we do with our own specificities and how we do it. Now, the problem with the present organization of science is that imagine yourself being in, say, Brazil. You want to publish in a Western journal. Western journals want to attract well-known names talking about hot topics so that their own visibility increases and that improves their impact factor because everything is driven by that down impact factor, which is a total madness, total madness. Forget about the impact factor. You know, we should start demonstrating against the impact factor. And uh, so if you want to talk about a hot topic, what are the hot topics? Well, maybe in biomedicine, it's going to be the fact that kids in the Western world have a lot of acne, or aging white males have sexual problems and they need some, some sort of stimulant, and so on. I'm not sure these are the most basic, most important problems to solve in biomedicine right now on the planet. And yet the Brazilian mind, which has been 
trained at great cost in Brazil with limited resources to do medicine is ending up s helping to solve problems which could look quite frivolous from some perspectives. That's, the, that's also the, the, the difficulty with our present system of science. It drains the mental capacity of scientists in the third world, giving thereby a kind of completely perverse foreign aid to the richest country where they need themselves that brain power to solve their own problems. Now, you can do absolutely good universal science solving other problems than those that interest Western people. And that's what I'm trying to argue about by recreating the commons, globalizing in a healthy way uh, science. And to do so, we've got to escape, we've got to escape the trap of systematically and madly, sorry about that, systematically and madly pursuing uh, excellence as a kind of unique goal. Let's create sites of excellence. Let's not forget quality. That's, that's my point. Again, thank you so much. This fabulous thing. So I think this presentation was representative for something we've tried to do over the past two days here, which is to put things into context. Also, um, of course, the topic of, of our conference in a historic context and then moving from the past to the present and looking into the future. And I'm very grateful that you walked us uh, through a, quite a timeline. Um, 